Welcome once again to the People of the Free Gift podcast, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach out to those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. Well, we are in the book of Hebrews still, and and today we're going to talk about a better hope. We've talked on a lot of different fronts that Jesus is our high priest, that Jesus is a better sacrifice, that Jesus is our prophet, that Jesus gives a better salvation. He provided us with better scripture, that he's better than the angels, all of these different things. And so now we're going to take a look at a better hope that Jesus offers us. And this is going to launch us into a conversation not only in terms of hope that we have in Jesus, but also the inheritance that's laid up for us in heaven, as well as the idea of heaven and the resurrection. And so let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to launch off in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. And the first thing that we learn about hope is that you can be fully assured in hope. Hope is different in the Bible, and in the way that God provides hope is different than the way that the world provides hope. Hope, when we use it in in a normal um, conversation, hope means something I want to see happen, and I'm not sure at all whether it will happen. And sometimes it can even convey an idea when we use the word hope as if it's probably not going to be ha- not going to happen. It would be absolutely amazing if it did happen, but I'm not really holding my breath that it is. Hope, when it comes to the Bible and the hope that Jesus gives you, is the complete opposite almost of that. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter six, verse eleven, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Hope is something that you can be fully assured in. It's something in the Bible, hope is something that you rest upon. Hope is a foundation upon which you stand. It's something that is out there in the future, something that is still yet to come, but it's absolutely certain. It's the thing that you can absolutely depend upon. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith and hope are absolutely interconnected. And usually you have the third part of that trinity, which is love. Faith, hope, and love is the cornerstone upon which the Christian faith is built, upon which all of the New Testament letters almost start out by blessing and wishing upon and praying for faith, hope, and love to manifest themselves within the congregations to whom they were written. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So the things that we hope for, faith is the evidence. Faith is the substance. Faith is um, the working out of the things that are hoped for. But the things that we hope for are absolutely certain. They're stable. They're the rock by which Everything else is built upon. And we're going to see this in two different analogies that are made for hope. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17 says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, 
and which entered into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us, entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's two different analogies that are being made here in this passage. And the first one, he says, to those of us who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We've talked about this before, but in the Old Testament, one of the very strange customs that God set up is strange from an outsider's perspective, but from a New Testament perspective, looking back, we can see that God was painting a picture. And what God did was he said that if anybody kills another person, that if it was an accident, it was, in other words, it wasn't premeditated, if it was an accident, then they would be able to flee to a city of refuge. And these cities of refuge were strategically located around the Israelite camp. The reason why they had to flee wasn't because the law was going to be after them and they'd be thrown in prison like we do. It was because the next of kin was going to be the avenger of blood. He was called upon to avenge the blood of his nearest relative that was just killed. Now, if it was premeditated murder, there's no escape for you. There's no mercy for you. If that avenger of blood catches you, he has every right to take revenge and kill you. But if it was was an accident, then you would be able to flee to the city of refuge and you would have to convince the city elders that it was in fact what we would call manslaughter. And if they believed you, If they accepted the case, they would allow you in the city and you were able to stay in that city and have refuge from what was out there and coming after you, the avenger of blood. They were not allowed to touch you as long as you stayed within that city. If you left and you went outside the boundaries again, then you were fair game. But as long as you were in that city and you would have to stay in that city until the high priest died. When the high priest in Israel died, then you were able to leave the city and all charges would, so to speak, would be dropped. All claims of the avenger of blood would be dropped and you would be able to be a free man. And we talked about this, how every part of that was a picture of Jesus. That when we crucify Jesus... Jesus cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so from Jesus' own words, he considered our crucifying him an act of manslaughter because it wasn't something that we fully knew what we were doing. And because it was manslaughter, we have the right and the privilege to flee to our city of refuge. Who is our city of refuge? Well, it tells us right here that we have fled for refuge. We fled to our city of refuge, and that city of refuge is Jesus. And Jesus, as our city of refuge, he also, by the way, is the avenger of blood. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so we have safety within the city of refuge until the high priest dies. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about who is our high priest. Our high priest is Jesus. And so Jesus died to start the whole cycle, okay? But Jesus ever lives as a priest after he has died. And so we are truly set free by our city of refuge, by our high priest, by even our avenger of blood. Because as we talked about last week, the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus when he died upon that cross. And so the vengeance for killing Jesus in reference to those of us who believe has already been paid for. 
There is no more condemnation. There is no more vengeance, no more wrath that God will pour out on you for those of us who have fled for refuge to Jesus. The second analogy that he gives here is he says, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which entered into that within the veil. Jesus is our hope, and Jesus is our anchor. The anchor is something for those of you who sail or those of you who, who um, work with you know, fishing or any of that kind of stuff. The anchor is the thing which it's heavy, it's loaded down, and is going to keep you where you want to be. The anchor is able to keep control when things are otherwise unstable, unsure. And so he says it's both sure and steadfast. It's the anchor of the soul. The soul is the seat of emotions. It's the, the place where we make a whole lot of our decisions. It's not necessarily what, how we make decisions, but it influences most of our decisions. The soul is where all of our you know, self-will, our, self, our usual way of dealing with problems and situations and temptations, it's our emotional reaction to things. And the hope is the anchor of the soul. Because when we look out, when we look at the situation right in front of us, everything looks unstable. Everything looks like it's absolutely temporary if it's going well, and it looks like it's going to last forever if it's going not so well. They say the only constant in life is change. So by nature, our existence, our lives are constantly filled with change, with instability, with movement. And sometimes that movement's good and positive, and sometimes that movement is negative or dangerous or scary. Our soul wants to react to the immediate. We want to react emotionally. We want to react in a way that, oh, I'm just going to fix this, and I'm going to put it right here, and I'm going to rest everything and my whole perspective on, on what's going on in front of me. What hope does, it allows you to get above the situation. Like Paul says, set your heart and your mind on things above where you are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Hope allows you to transcend your current situation and plop down an anchor in which you say, I shall not be moved. And so moving on to this idea of inheritance. So now that we've talked about what hope is, let's talk about what we have hope in. What is our hope? And one of the things that it talks about is this idea of inheritance. And I want to distinguish real quick between the idea of salvation and the idea of inheritance. The moment that you receive Jesus, you have eternal life. You have the Son. You have Jesus, who is the gift of God. Everything that God has to give, he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But the Bible also talks about this idea of inheritance. It talks about crowns. It talks about ruling and reigning with Christ. It talks about rewards. It talks about all of us standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And the first thing that we need to establish is that Jesus is the heir of all things. Our inheritance is completely tied up in our relationship to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days 
spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus is the heir of all things. Any inheritance that we get as believers is completely wrapped up in and tied into our relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is the one who shares, so to speak, his inheritance with us. The second thing I want to lay down is that the kingdom must be received. Again, I want to establish a difference between salvation and the kingdom. Salvation, like we said, is something that automatically is given to you the moment you accept Jesus Christ. The kingdom is something that God desires to give you. The offer is already there, and it's lived out by a moment-by-moment, day-by-day, living out of the reality that God has gifted you with. That reality is the Holy Spirit living within you. There's a distinction when you read your Bibles between when it says entering the kingdom and inheriting the kingdom. There's a world of difference between those two. There are believers who will enter the kingdom, who, but who will not inherit the kingdom. And it's the, for the same reason that there are those who will get to have, will not enter the kingdom, who will not be saved, and who will be saved. There was an offer on the table that Jesus put it on your heart that I want to give you myself. I want to forgive you of your sins. I want to give you eternal life. And we in turn, if we have if we are believers, we in turn said to Jesus, "Yes, that's what I want. I want what you have to give me. Please save me." And at that moment, Jesus fulfilled his offer. There are others who say at that moment, and maybe you're here and you've been doing this your entire life, and God's perhaps giving you one more chance that you have to accept his offer. But those people, they receive that offer, God draws them to himself, and they turn and they say, no, thank you. I don't want it. I don't want any part of it. And so perhaps further down the line, God offers again, they keep saying no. And those people are not going to go to heaven. They're not going to enter the kingdom if they die in that state. The same thing is true for believers. The same thing is true for every single one of us that God has laid on the table every single gift that he has to offer. And sometimes we're just ignorant of those gifts Sometimes we just flat out say no to those gifts. And one of those gifts is the kingdom. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The kingdom is given in language that says that God desires to give you the kingdom. And here we see is put in language, we need to receive the kingdom. How do we receive the kingdom? Well, let's look at a positive example of inheritance followed by a negative example example of inheritance from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, speaking of Abraham, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, Abraham wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Abraham's whole experience was completely one of grace. It was God pursuing Abraham and going after Abraham. God had plans for Abraham. And so often, Abraham just totally rejected those plans. But God kept pursuing. He kept showing grace. And he kept giving and offering what he wanted to give to Abraham. And at, in the process, because Abraham was receptive to what God had to, to offer him, God did ultimately fulfill his promises to Abraham. So when God first called Abraham, you may not realize this, but God told him, leave your family, go to the place where I'm going to show you. And what did Abraham do? He says, I'm going to wait till my father dies. And then after his father dies, then he moves on. But he took Lot. And so then Lot causes him a whole bunch of problems. Eventually, Lot you know, gets dealt with by God through other means and other stories. And then Abraham is able to keep on moving on. And then this whole idea of the promised child and Abraham taking matters into his own hands to create this child, and then God having to teach him, that's not the way that I work. If I'm going to do something, trust me, I have the ability to do it. They finally have Isaac. Then God teaches him other lessons. And this is constant growing and learning experience. But when everything was said and done, did Abraham end up doing what God wanted him to do? Did Abraham show by his actions that he was receptive of the promise that God wanted to give him and to give on to Isaac and to Jacob after him? Absolutely. And it says that his mindset was that he was looking for a city and a building whose maker was God. You read the account of Abraham in Genesis and you think that he's just kind of wandering around and, you know, God ultimately fulfills his promise to Abraham through his descendants way down the line. <clears throat> but Abraham took one step at a time. Sometimes he failed to receive what God wanted to give him because of his own agenda, because of his sin, because of different things that were going on. But ultimately, ultimately, God was faithful and he showed himself faithful to Abraham through his grace and his mercy. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham and Abraham is a positive model of one who ultimately inherited that which God placed as a deep desire within his heart and a promise that he had made to him. Now for the negative example of inheritance. And that would be Esau. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. It says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. How would you like to be living on in infamy in the Bible, the word of God, after that description? Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright? For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now this goes back to Genesis as well, but this is a whole sordid mess. Jacob and Esau, they were fighting literally within the womb. They were twins, and they were fighting for who is going to come out first. That is not setting up for a healthy family dynamic, okay? So Esau, he comes out first, and Jacob is the younger by, like, literally, like, no time at all, okay? Um, but because Esau was the firstborn... 
the right should go to the firstborn naturally. The inheritance, the birthright, the blessing, all of that stuff would go to the firstborn as a natural course of actions. But God said to the parents already, the younger or the older will serve the younger. God told them in advance that Jacob was going to be the one who inherited all those things. Now, Jacob is an interesting story in himself because his name, you know, even means, you know, one who wrestles with God. And it means supplanter, you know. Actually, Israel means one who wrestles with God. And Jacob, his original name means supplanter. He was a conniver. He was a liar. And he came up with this scheme that he was going to take what God wanted to give him. He was going to take it by force, by trickery. And so one of the things that he does, his brother was a hunter. Esau was a hunter. He was a wild man, a man of the field. And his father liked that. Okay, some of you might be able to relate to that. But Esau didn't care about the right things. What would have been his naturally, he had no interest at all in. So one day Esau is out hunting all day. Jacob was a mommy's boy. Let's just call it like it is, okay? Jacob stayed at home. He was his mother's favorite. Him and his mother had this whole scheme going. And Jacob was very domestic. He knew how to cook. And so one day, Jacob is cooking some awesome stew. Esau comes home after a long time out hunting. He's starving. He's hungry, okay? And he's... But he is in a state in which what was already going on on the inside of him was about to come out. We are about to see what happens when somebody doesn't care at all about the inheritance that God wants to give them, the gifts that God wants to give them. Esau comes home. Jacob, conniver as he is, says, I'll give you some stew if you sell, you give me your birthright. Now, how many of you, honestly, if you were in that situation, would be like, Jacob, you got to be kidding me. I mean, all I have to do is go into the house. Mom and dad, I'm sure, are going to feed me, and they're not going to ask me for my birthright. But Esau cared so little about the things of God, about the destiny, about things of the future and hope that he says, fine, just give me some stew. And then the drama continues and it goes on for years. But let me show you that it, the difference between Abraham and Esau is really Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham failed time and time and time again. But there was a part of Abraham, and all it takes is a part that was receptive to the things of God and what God wanted to do through him. There was a conflict that went on in Abraham between what his flesh wanted to do or what his flesh wanted to react, or his soul emotionally wanted to react to in the situation, and the deep desires of his heart. But he kept on going towards God. He kept on coming back to God. And ultimately, he was receptive of what God wanted to do in his life. Esau didn't care. Esau, for our purposes, Esau reflects the person who, when God gives us his word, they just don't have any desire 
to experience the gift of God's word. When God gives us the ability, the direct access to his throne grace that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and we have the ability to just come boldly before the throne of grace to get the help that we need when we need it, to find that empathetic ear, to find that strength and support, to find everything that we need in him and come to him in prayer. There are some Christians that just say, absolutely, I just don't care. I just don't have any desire. I don't have time for it. I don't want to. You know what? I don't have need of anything. And the list just goes on and on and on. Opportunities to serve with the spiritual gift that God has given you. Opportunities to give with the resources that God has provided for you. Opportunities to share the gospel, to encourage a friend, to share a scripture, to bring comfort or conviction as the time comes and is needed. We all have a bit of Abraham and Esau in us. There's times when we do really great and we desire what God desires for us and we act upon it and we step into that blessing. And there's times when we're like Esau and we don't care. And what we can take before God is God, give me the desire to be more like Abraham and less like Esau. Lord, there's a conflict going on in me. Honestly, I don't a lot of times see the value of spending the time, the money, or the just emotional energy to choose your way over mine. But I'm torn. Because I want, I, I deep down I, I do, I want, I want what you want me to have. I want what you want to give. Taking it before the throne of grace so that we can find the help in the time of need. And lastly, heaven changes the way we live on earth. Shifting gears here from inheritance to heaven. Heaven is something that inherently comes to all believers. Inheritance is something that our choices which reflect what we receive of God and what we don't receive of God on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment, year-by-year scale. Heaven is what we automatically, right now, are sealed for our place in heaven. Heaven and hope and all that God wants to give us changes the way that we live on earth. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 says, These, all the great examples that listed before then, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they they might have had opportunity to to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. 
for he has prepared for them a city. Heaven changes the way that we live on earth. And one of the ways in which we can tell whether we are in fact citizens of heaven and strangers and pilgrims on this earth is by what priorities there are. Where do we rest our hope? Do we rest our hope on temporal things? Do we rest our hope on how much money we can make and what kind of career we can have and how, what kind of house we can live in and where we live and what kind of people we associate with, what kind of school that we're going to go to, what kind of car that we drive? Or do we place our hope where it belongs? In heaven. In Jesus. In the better things. In the better country. Whose builder and maker is God. If you're here today and you don't have that peace with God, you don't have that relationship with God, you don't have rest within your soul, if you don't have hope as your anchor, sure and steadfast, immovable, and you can accept that offer, that gift that God wants to give you right now from where you're sitting and before you leave this room, you can be absolutely assured of your place with God. You can be absolutely assured of your place in heaven. You can have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and changing you from the inside out. And all of a sudden, you're going to have a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit, and you're going to be a new creation. You can settle all of that before you leave this room between you and God in your own words, just saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe that you paid for my sins by Jesus' death on the cross and rising again from the dead. Come inside of my heart. I desire to follow you. Change me from the inside out. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I promise you, if you do that with sincerity, and real intent, then he will honor his promise. And if you're here and you're a believer, it's a wake-up call. It's a time to examine our hearts. And we're going to celebrate communion in a few minutes. And it's an awesome opportunity to just reflect on what really is important. Where is our hope centered? What do we look for? for our identity, our fulfillment, our purpose? Are we looking here in this world, in this life, at the things that are before us? Or are we looking at those things that are eternal, that better country, that place that has been set before us? Are we living for eternity? Is the kingdom of God at home in us? Are we more like Abraham? Or are we more like Esau? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to come before you and your word. and Thank you for your son and all that he is. And I thank you for this book of Hebrews, Lord, that has just been so, so amazing in reminding us that Jesus is far better than anything the world has to offer, anything that comes from our past, anything that we look to in our future, Lord, he's better. And so, Father, I pray that you would draw those to yourself that need to be drawn, Lord, that you would convict those who need to be convicted, and that you would encourage those who need to be encouraged, Lord. I pray, Father, that you have taught us something new, I pray, Father, that you have grown us in a new way. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. 
And so if you go to www.peopleofthefreegift.com, you can access all of our articles, all of our videos, all of our podcasts, and everything else our ministry has to offer completely for free. For those who are in a position who are led of the Lord, we do appreciate your donations, and you can do so through that same website. We'd love to connect with you, and so you can catch up with us through the website, through Facebook, through Twitter, Google+, and Pinterest. And we'd love to hear your ideas, your comments, your questions for future podcasts.